Hello to everyone. Welcome back to Chata Tisholi. Today, our Chata Tisholi is Dr. Ian Thompson. He is the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer and Senior Director of Choctaw Nation's Historic Preservation Department, Wheelock Academy, Tushkahoma Capital Museum. He leads our department in protecting Choctaw historic sites in a nine state area, restores aban restoring abandoned Choctaw cemeteries, repatriating Choctaw sacred objects and human remains, researching Choctaw history, and helping the community revitalize Choctaw culture. He's also led recent efforts to revitalize Choctaw traditional pottery. And today he'll be speaking about the work that he and his wife, Amy, um, are doing at Nanawaya Farm, which is dedicated to preserving an indigenous relationship to land. So now I'm going to turn over the presentation to him. Thank you, Megan. I, I'm honored to be on the Tosholi Speaker Series. I've been really impressed with the series, the work that you've done and the dialogue that's created. So I'm going to go ahead and get started with my presentation. Hopefully it will pull up in the right way. There we go. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. The title of the talk is Choctaw Plant Knowledge, a 21st Century Experiment. A lot of times in anthropology, the term that's given towards indigenous plant knowledge is ethnobotany. For Choctaw in particular, you know, the information that exists in the written literature is mostly just plant names with uses. Um, but that is just such a tiny bit of the original information that existed. It's been removed from its context. It doesn't have information about how those plants grew or were managed or were collected on the landscape. It doesn't talk about all the variables in their use. It doesn't talk about how different families use them. Most of the information that's available doesn't even give the Choctaw names for the plants, let alone what a literal translation of those names means. So what I'm going to present today is, is a different take on plants. And it's one that I, I believe is more indigenous, hopefully more interesting. I remember when I first went to the Choctaw homeland, Mississippi and Alabama as a kid, I encountered landscapes like this, and these landscapes are completely dominated by plants. But what impressed me was at the time, wondering how our ancestors could live in an environment that looked like that. You know, those must have been some pretty tough people to make a living in, in a place that, that's like that. Over time, as I learned more about our ancestors and our indigenous culture and our homeland, what impressed me shifted from being that they could live in a landscape like that to being impressed with something entirely different. We step back in time a little bit. We find that the landscape that's there today is nothing like the landscape that once existed. Um, Eugene Hilgard was the father of modern soil science. He moved into Choctaw and Chickasaw country in the 1850s. And what he had to say was, well, might the Chickasaws and Choctaws question the moral right of the act by which the beautiful park like hunting grounds were turned over to another race. Under their system, these lands would have lasted forever. Under ours, as heretofore practiced, in less than a century more, the state would be reduced to the condition of the Roman compagna. So from this quote, and again, it's from an authority. It's someone that invented soil science for the United States. From this quote, we learned several different things about the Choctaw homeland and how it differed from the picture that I just showed you. First, we learned that it was park-like. Well, park-like implies open. It implies an open tree canopy. It implies grassy areas. That's certainly not what we just saw in that picture or indeed what we see in many parts of the Choctaw homeland today. We also learned that it wasn't an accident that the lands were like that. You know, there was a system that our ancestors in place that made them that way, that made them park-like. So it wasn't just their, their natural inclination. It wasn't just the plant's natural inclination, but it was intentional management. We also learned that at least the father of modern soil science thought that our system was completely sustainable forever and that he felt that the system that was in place 150 years ago was not. Stepping back a little bit farther into time, Gideon Lincecum is a Euro-American who moved to Choctaw country around 1820 and he became friends with the Choctaw people. He grew to respect Choctaw people. Ten years later, after the signing of the Indian Removal Act, um, a number of Europeans moved into the area, a number of Euro-Americans. They were his own countrymen, but what he had to say about them was, 
The locality was soon overrun and cut down by a race of world spoilers. That's what he referred to his own people as once he'd come to see a, a more indigenous perspective of the land. The image that you see there is Longleaf Pine Forest. This is actually what this looked like before its current state. It was Longleaf Pine Forest. That, that particular scene is from Western Alabama. The Longleaf Pine Forest was cut down through Euro-American economic activities. And when this happened, not just here, but across the Choctaw homeland, when these activities happened, they led to an ecological disaster. I mean, obviously you can see or infer the impact that removing the trees would have, but it allowed the ground to um, be impacted severely by wind and rain leading to erosion. If you look at pollen diagrams from our homeland from this time period, they show an explosion of ragweed right at the time of Choctaw removal across the landscape. That indicates massive ground disturbance in the area. So it's not just that the trees were removed, but it was a complete ecosystemic change. This is a picture a little bit farther in the past of that change happening. Still a little bit farther in the past. This is Olsi. He is a Choctaw man and he's sitting in an original longleaf pine forest. This is an old growth forest. Some of the trees were 100 feet to the first branch. But even so, even though it was this massive old growth forest, you can see behind them the light is hitting the ground. And you can see there's all this understory growth there. This is very different from this scene. So actually, what to me, what becomes amazing is not that our ancestors were able to live in a place like this, but rather that they were able to manage a place that could become like this, but rather they managed it to look like this. This is a, a longleaf pine forest in western Alabama, and this one's not old growth, but it still gives an idea of what it looks like. You've got an open tree canopy, and it's basically growing in a tall grass prairie. Um, this landscape was managed by being regularly set on fire by the indigenous people that lived there. And the understory has the second highest plant diversity outside of the tropics in the world. Amazingly diverse place. It's very comfortable in a lot of ways. It's well suited to supporting human life. This was just one type of landscape within the Choctaw homeland. In this image, you see Choctaw concepts, Choctaw names for the different types of landscapes. You can see the Choctaw settlement area there at the center. The longleaf pine forest is the dark green area just north of the coast. Of course, that was inhabited by our ancestors and the ancestors of other people. Along with the coastal areas, as you head north, you get into a lighter green shade. That's a, a mixed forest. Um, some of it's hardwood, some of it's pine, but it also had an open understory, similar to what I just showed you, an open canopy as well. The areas in tan color, there's a, a crescent-shaped one, sort of towards the middle of the image, and one just to the bottom left of that. These are prairie regions. The one towards the top of the screen is the Black Belt Prairie, and the one below that, below the Choctaw Villages there, that's the Jackson Prairie. People don't often think of Choctaw country as being prairie country, but in some areas it was. Prairie is called Oktok in the Choctaw language, and prairie is what I'm going to focus on for most of my presentation today. The Black Belt prairies originally extended in some areas for 40 miles in width. Um, early accounts talk about the prairie being seen from horizon to horizon without trees in it. They also talk about the grasses being as tall as a man on horseback. They also talk about in the spring and summer, the prairies being just absolutely covered in a vivid array of wildflowers waving like ocean, ocean waves in the wind. People don't think of Choctaws as being prairie people. Yeah, I mean, that, that's fair. Certainly most of our villages were located in wooded areas, but some of our ancestors did live on the prairie. The Chickasaw Hay Choctaws, the Chickasha Ahi, were actually known as the Choctaws of the prairie because in the early French period, they had recently moved from the Black Belt Prairie of Alabama. But going farther back, we have many more connections with the prairie. In fact, one of the earliest Choctaw oral traditions is set on the Black Belt Prairie. This was not long after the Choctaw people had emerged as an ethnicity. And these oral traditions, there, there are two of them, they talk about this area being home to a type of animal that's extinct now. It's a giant animal that lived in herds. And these animals were so large that they girdled the trees as they ate the bark off of them. They broke off the lower branches and killed them. And this, according to the tradition, is part of what created the Black Belt Prairie. You know, the, these descriptions, it appears certainly to me that they're talking about the Pleistocene megafauna, 
mammoths and the mastodons that lived in this area, you know, ate shrubs and different things. These animals went extinct in the region about 12,000 years ago. So if you take the story literally as I do, that means that our ancestors have a connection with the curry going back about 600 generations. Choctaw oral stories talk about how animals help to maintain the prairies that are in our homeland. Um, Choctaw people and others help to maintain those prairies as well. They're fire adapted ecosystems. Our ancestors regularly burn not just the prairie, but the most of the landscapes in our homeland uh, fairly frequently. In some areas, it was maybe about every three years or so. Fire expands the prairie. Um, it also expands the landscape that I showed you, the open canopy pine forests, the open canopy hardwood forests. It resets ecological succession. So it sets the plants back to zero. When they regrow, they have more nutrition than the old growth. So that concentrates game animals in that area, it makes them easier to hunt. Burning removes the old growth. So it makes it easier to walk through these areas. Certain plants are fire adapted. So fires favor some species of plants over others. Fires also create certain characteristics in individual plants. For example, dogwood that arrow shafts can be made from. Um, if it's allowed to just grow in a shaded environment, it'll have lots of twigs, it'll be crooked. It's difficult to make those shoots into an arrow. But if the area is burned, immediately straight dogwood shoots come up and they're, they're perfect for making arrows. There are other things like that as well. For example, river cane is, is very fire dependent and very important in our culture. The prairie connects our homeland with other parts of the United States. In the Choctaw homeland, the, the Black Belt and the Jackson prairies are basically still in existence because they're underlined by chalk soils that make it difficult for trees to grow. The other prairies that you see on this map, particularly the ones to the west, exist not because of what's in the soil, but because of rainfall. In these areas, there's not enough rainfall for them to be fully enveloped in trees particularly with the management of indigenous communities that lived in this area, regularly burning them as well. When Choctaw people came to Indian territory, what's now southeastern Oklahoma, this area had a number of prairies in it. James Nuttall came through here in 1819. He was a botanist and he records from about the Poto area down to Fort Towson in the west, many prairies. Um, the landscape wasn't completely plains, but there were prairies and around them, you know, there were different trees and scrubby areas. It was very diverse. And what he was seeing was the in management that the indigenous people here, the Caddo had had on the land. He was still seeing the remnant effects of the fires that they had lit. He also described bison in this area, bison are a keystone species of the prairie. So bison helped to, to keep the prairie and manage it. Choctaw people, you know, moved right into the prairie regions of southeastern Oklahoma, and in some ways they were like the prairies at home. An early Choctaw church around Bennington, Oklahoma is called Chishoktok. Uh, that comes from Chishoktok, that means post oak prairie. The Choctaw Nation Cultural Center located in Durant is situated on a remnant prairie, about 100 acres of it. It's a beautiful prairie that still exists, still survives from the original landscape of this area. In the late 1800s, Sherman, Texas produced more hay than any other part of the United States. And the reason for that was because of the tall grass prairie that was right here in this area. I talked about the damage to the ecosystems that happened after Choctaws were prevented from managing them in our homeland. And unfortunately, something similar happened in Oklahoma as well. After tribal lands were allotted, uh, government officials encourage tribal members to lease out their land to sharecroppers. In the 1920s, southeastern Oklahoma had the highest incidence of sharecropping in the whole country. And the folks that, that managed those lands, the sharecroppers, unfortunately didn't necessarily respect the land or the Choctaw people that owned it. So they tried to maximize production. And by doing that, they used techniques that basically farmed out the fertility of the soil and caused it to erode, just like what had happened in the Choctaw homeland. There are accounts from Choctaw people that, that witness this time and they talk about particular pieces of land that used to be fertile enough to raise cotton and corn um, being so depleted that they could only grow grasses in a relatively short time. These same management practices ultimately led to the Dust Bowl about 10 years later out west. We often think of Choctaw traditional knowledge. We often think of indigenous landscapes kind of in terms of this picture. You know, they were, they were pushed out through colonization. But really, Choctaw culture is something that's alive. And this means rather than just being destroyed, it can also be revitalized. It can also be created anew. 
And in many ways, the same thing is true for indigenous landscapes. So my wife, Amy, and I have been doing Choctaw traditional culture for a long time, since we were children. I've been you know, eating traditional foods. I've been making traditional art since I was seven years old. But we wanted to take that knowledge and try to apply it in a, a way that was broader, more of a lifestyle kind of way, and adapt it more to the land. So we came up with an experiment called Nanawaya Farm. Nanawaya is the place where the Choctaws and, according to some stories, the Chickasaws were created. It's in East Central Mississippi. And what it means is a place of growth. So we wanted this experiment, this farm, to be a place of growth for us where we could learn about really applying the indigenous ethic of land management and connect it with you know, land management techniques used by other folks as well. So the goals of this endeavor were to restore the landscape of the farm, to produce healthy food, to support our community, and to bring to light aspects of indigenous Choctaw culture. After looking for the land for a while, we found one place that was on the market that was available, which met the criteria that we had for this, this project. My light just went out, so I'm going to jump in All right. The, the farm's located in um, eastern Natoka County, you know, pretty close to the town of Darwin, Oklahoma. If you know where that is, it's very rural. This is what it looks like. It measures half a mile by half a mile. It's 160 acres. The dark areas that you see there are lowland, uh, spring fed. The lighter color areas that you see there are upland. When we purchased the farm, like most of this region, it had suffered from years of extractive management. The picture that you see there, that is a solid stand of goat weed. That's all that's growing there on the upland, just that one single plant. That like ragweed, it indicates disturbance. Talked about the ecological disasters of the past in the Choctaw homeland and Indian territory. Well, in many ways, they're still going on today. This is a picture of one part of the landscape of the farm that we purchased. And you can see it's just bare soil. This is an area that gets 48 inches of rain per year that should not have bare soil, but did when we bought it. This was because of an extractive form of management. In essence, um, people fenced in the landscape of Oklahoma and elsewhere and set it up for cattle raising. Without the animals being able to leave, they get concentrated there on that particular piece of land. And people tend to want to maximize their profits, so it's tempting to put more animals on the land than it can support long term. When this happens, the animals graze their favorite plants first. Well, really, in any scenario, they're going to graze their favorite plants first. But when it's fenced in, they can't move on to another area, so they just keep eating their favorite plant. As it regrows, they eat it again. As it regrows, they eat it again. Every time it regrows, it has to pull nutrients and resources from its roots in order to grow its leaves and its stem. So over time, the roots get depleted. Eventually, this kills the plant, and then the animals start focusing on their second favorite plant and so on. This creates holes in the landscape. When these holes are created ecologically, they're filled by other native plants, things like goat weed and ragweed. They have broad leaves. Um, they're not palatable to the animals. So in a natural situation, that encourages the animals to move on to another area so that the land can regenerate. But if they're concentrated there, that can't happen. There's a, a certain ethic of land management that says that when those types of plants start to emerge, you need to spray them with poison and get rid of them. So that's what happens. And then ranchers often fill in the voids that are created by the poisoning with invasive grasses that are extremely aggressive and able to withstand repeated grazing of intensive agriculture. This creates a landscape that's almost a dead zone like you see here. It has almost no ecological value. There are almost no pollinator plants in it. Uh, it does not protect the soil. It does not have deep roots. And so we're left with big areas of dead landscape across the central part of the United States. To reverse that, you know, we're not the only ones thinking about this. There are people from all other walks of life that are thinking about restorative agriculture, but we try to think about it from a Choctaw perspective. And I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. But if you look at any group's culture, one of the most direct relationships between people and the land is food. And if you look at Choctaw food and land management, there are sort of four pillars for interacting with the land. The first of these is purity. For the Choctaw ancestors, that meant keeping things in the sacred order that God had created and handed down to Choctaw people and others at Nanawaya. So, for example, um, Choctaw people noticed that the hog didn't live a very clean life. So Choctaws avoided eating pork meat for decades after the French introduced it to us. Years later, um, even after Choctaws started to eat hog meat, 
men who had expecting wives would stay away from that meat because they thought it might damage their unborn children. And of course, much more recent research has shown that hogs do carry diseases and many of these diseases cause epidemics among native communities shortly after contact. Diversity, you know, the Choctaw Foodway came from agricultural fields, corn, bean, and squash fields. It came from melon patches. It came from house fields. It came from each of the ecosystems that I just showed you in that map of the Choctaw homeland. It came from the ocean in some cases. It came from rivers. This was extremely diverse. You know, Choctaw food ingredients came from dozens and dozens of different plants, dozens of different animals. If there was a drought and the corn crop failed, all people had to do was rely on those other resources to a larger extent to make it through until the rains returned. This was sustainability. Um, it avoided causing significant impacts to favorite food resources. It also led to strength. You know, basically diversity leads to strength when it comes to an ecosystem or a food way. The whole, um, there's a lot that I could say about this, but let's just think about the Choctaw cornfield that I mentioned over there on the left. You know, these were planted first, the corn seeds were put into the ground and those plants were allowed to grow up to a couple feet tall. Then the agriculturalists came back and planted beans around the corn. The beans grew up around the corn, on the corn stalk. The corn stalk provided a place for the beans to run. The beans are legumes, they're nitrogen fixers, so they pull nitrogen out of the air and put it in the soil, replacing some of the fertility that the corn takes out. After the beans were growing, they planted squash between the corn and bean rows. And Choctaw squash have these giant leaves that shade the ground from the sun and help it to hold on to moisture. So together, these plants create an ecosystem, along with sunflowers, lamb's quarter, different things that would come up there. These create an ecosystem. Similarly, for Choctaw food, if you eat just corn by itself, it's not very nutritious. But if you add in beans and squash and lamb's quarter and sunflower seeds, suddenly together it becomes extremely nutritious. It's almost like an ecosystem of food. That's one concept of the whole. Respect. You know, when Choctaws were encountered by Europeans, there were several things about us that annoyed Europeans. One of these is that we only, our ancestors only worked a few hours a day and spent the rest of the time socializing, you know, enjoying each other's company. Europeans saw that as being lazy. Choctaws were one of the largest and, you know, one of the strongest Native American tribes in the Southeastern United States. Yet we rarely attacked other tribes in their own homeland. To the French, that meant we were cowards. Choctaw people, um, followed a life way that anthropologists would classify as either a, a tribal level society or a chiefdom level society. You know, these are lower than a state level society like Europeans. So in a way, our whole culture is classified as a failure to achieve state level society. But when you think about these things from terms of landscape and sustainability, each of these things that was annoying to our visitors were actually signs of respect. So, you know, we had a life way that, that was efficient. Within about four hours of work per day, we could get all that we needed. So we didn't spend the other eight hours of the day extracting the land's resources. You know, that was respect for the land. We, we took what we needed, but we didn't continue to extract resources. We didn't invade the territory of other tribes because we had respect for them for the most part. You know, it wasn't a Choctaw cultural ethic to invade another group's land, usually. With state level society, again, we didn't adapt. We didn't continue to grow without slowing down um, because it was a respect for the land. There was no reason to just continue to grow and grow and grow. It, it was not sustainable. So how do you enact these on the landscape? Well, it begins with rebuilding respect. This land that had been overgrazed for decades, the first thing that we did was we took all animals off of it for a year to allow the plants in the soil a chance to start to regrow. It takes a lot longer than a year for that to happen, but that was the beginning of the process. While the animals were off of it and thereafter, we set up the pasture system that you see here, 24 different pastures. When we brought the animals back, they graze in one of those pastures and we only leave them there for about four days or so. That's enough time that they can graze their favorite plant, but they don't have time to come back and graze it again when it's regrown. They only get to graze it once and then they move on. With 24 pastures, if they average four days in each pasture, that's almost 100 days of rest that plant gets before they come back to it. So this in a way, they're confined on the land, but in a way, it also brings back the natural system of eventually moving on, not just being on the same little piece of land forever and ever. This technique is really successful for regrowing overgrazed plants, 
it's not something that you do in perpetuity. You know, 10 years from now, we'll have a different system that focuses on fostering diversity on the plants in the landscape. But for right now, this is helping the landscape to recover. In order for the land to recover, we introduced one of the keystone species, bison. These are our first two calves that were born on the land. Bison are prairie managers. If you give them what they need, they'll create a prairie for you, or they'll create an open woodland for you, depending on the amount of rainfall and fire and that kind of thing. The line at the center of this picture is the fence. On the left-hand side is a pasture that they grazed about eight days ago. On the right-hand side is a pasture that they just finished grazing. And you can see how they hit their favorite plants but then they can't hit it again because they moved to another pasture. So those plants get to regrow, they get to rebuild their roots, they get to seed and they get to start to spread and take back over the land so that they resemble more what a healthy ecosystem would be. You can do this with cattle, you can do it with horses, you can do it with sheep, but bison are special in some of their behaviors. Unlike the other animals that create wallows, which is what you see here, these wallows reset ecological succession. So by having these on the landscape, um, they're gonna be they're gonna have colonizing plants move into them. And this is different than the type of plants that live in the other areas. So it creates heterogeneity and diversity in the plants on the landscape. Bison love cedar trees. They'll rub all over them in the summertime. I think the sap helps keep the bugs off of them. So they will kill cedar trees, which is a good thing. Cedar trees are native, but they're invasive now because there aren't landscape scale fires like there were in the past. So the bison help to get rid of the cedar trees where they shouldn't be. If bison are allowed to be in a certain area for very long, they also create trails. The early accounts from southeastern Oklahoma mentioned bison trails all the time. They were used as routes of transportation for people too. These trails, of course, also set up reset ecological succession back to zero. With these techniques, this is how the landscape changed in three years. This is almost exactly the same scene on the land. Um, both of these were taken in a D1 level drought at the same time of year. So you're looking at real change in the landscape. The left-hand side in 2015, that pasture is completely covered in goat weed. On the right-hand side, it's still got some goat weed, but it's growing up in grasses, different types of native plants. It's much healthier, more diverse ecosystem. And this just happened in three years. The change isn't complete. It'll take probably decades, but you can see how much happened in a short time of changing the management. As we did this, we started to, um, in places where in places where it ha everything hadn't been sprayed and poisoned out and planted invasive grasses, we had an explosion of native prairie plants come up. The only thing we did was change the management. And suddenly we had 180 different species of native prairie plants come up in our pastures. This image shows the plants above and below ground. On the left-hand side, that's one of the invasive pasture grasses. You can see how it's short and its roots amount to almost nothing in the soil. Many of these prairie plants have roots that go down eight or 10 feet into the soil. They're, part, they're a central part of the ecosystem. Um, each plant puts exudates into the soil. They're these chemicals that are the food for specific types of bacteria. You know, they say in something like one tablespoon of soil, there are 10 million different soil organisms, most of which have never even been studied by Western science. Well, each one of those soil organisms contributes to the life of these plants through relationships through the roots. So when you restore these plants, you're also restoring the health and resiliency of the soil. These roots are massive. Big blue stem is one of the main native tall grasses. <clears throat> one acre of big blue stem has 18,000 pounds of carbon in its roots. This carbon helps to mitigate against drought. It also helps to prevent soil loss. This is little blue stem, a smaller grass in New Mexico. And you can see how that one patch of little blue stem there held onto the soil in these dust bowl like conditions. Above ground, these plants have relationships with specific types of insects too. Um, this is an insect I encountered out there just a couple days ago. I don't know what it is. It looks, it's shaped like a stealth fighter. It's got the coloration of a cicada killer. But if you look at its legs, they're covered in pollen. It's out there collecting pollen on some native plant. Today, because of the dead landscapes, you know, we're, we're noticing a lot of impact on the honeybee which is bad, but the honeybee is not a native animal. There are 4,000 species of native bees that pollinate these plants along with the moths and the butterflies and the wasps. As I mentioned, fire was crucial for our ancestors in maintaining the landscapes that they lived in. We've worked some to reintroduce it to our land, setting up controlled burns, occasionally having a fire get out. Um, these, of course, reset ecological succession, as I mentioned. 
So if you're an animal, you'd much rather go to the area of the right there to graze than the area to the left. That black soil carbon heats up the soil faster in the spring, which allows plant germination. When the plants are burned, the first growth that comes up is extremely nutritious. So animals love to concentrate on that. And of course, these fires burn up ticks. Um, if they burn regularly across a landscape, it's in a patchy way. It's, it's not just, it doesn't just blacken the whole landscape. It travels to certain areas and its effects are different. So it increases that diversity and heterogeneity that we were talking about on the land, which leads to resiliency. After five years, you know, as I mentioned, we had 180 different native prairie species appear in our pastures, but there were a few important species that just didn't come back. You know, the management of the past had been harsh enough that it had completely extirpated them from our farm. So we worked to replant them this year. Uh, our technique was almost like a, a Choctaw, a little Choctaw garden patch. We'd go out in the pasture with a hoe, clear out the plants and the roots, and then we would plant legume seeds like the Choctaw corn at the center of those patches. And then we'd plant the sunflowers and the grass around that, a symbiotic relationship, creating their own little ecosystem there. So far this year, we've planted 2,500 of those patches in our pastures. And it'll be exciting to see how those move along through the through the years coming up. Um, you know, part of this work was also trying to restore purity to the land, and that means removing invasive species. This is my wife Amy with just one patch of of multiple patches of invasive Bradford pears that we've cut out of our land. Bradford pears make pretty ornamental trees, but when they go wild out on the land, they turn into these nasty thorn thickets. Invasive species are, are a real problem. It's not just because they don't belong there, but they're not part of that integrated ecosystem like all the other plants that we've talked about. You know, all the other plants support specific microbes in the soil. They support specific pollinators. They're specific animals and birds and insects that eat them. That's not so for invasive plants. They don't have that relationship. So a lot of times there's nothing that eats them and they just spread like wildfire across the landscape. You know, invasive plants like Bradford pear can turn the prairie into this dead zone almost as fast as overgrazing it. Earlier, I was talking about the, the quotes from the Choctaw prairie areas in Mississippi, how in the summer and uh, the springtime, there were like waves of wildflowers in the, in the wind. And that's certainly something that we've seen on our land is all of these amazing wildflowers. When I was a kid, I had no of them as, you know, something like a flower garden. But since that time, I've been important there, not just ecologically, but when you think about these plants, all the ones that I'm showing you, by the way, are came up on our farm without seeding, just by changing the management. All of these plants have their unique relationships with the land. You know, these plants grow in southeastern Oklahoma. Many of these same species grow in the Choctaw homeland. You know, as you go out among them, it's interesting to think about all of the native people who encountered those same plants through time. You know, all of the faces of Choctaw women who stopped to smell this particular flower through the last 15,000 years. It's life affirming to think about it in that way. To think about it in another way, these are little pieces of the land. These are little pieces of our homeland. They're little pieces of Choctaw culture that are coming back. To me, that's something that, that speaks to the significance and the spirit of the land and the plants and the animals that have been created there. The diversity is pretty amazing. And these are just a few. I could show you dozens and dozens more. Some of the plants that have return to our land are critically threatened. This is slender Indian grass. It's critically threatened in Oklahoma, but just by changing the management, suddenly we had patches of it coming up all over two of our pastures. This is blue flower Uriango. It's not even recorded for our county, although it's a native plant. By changing the, the management, suddenly we have hundreds of these coming up in our lowlands. Again, it's not just about the plant. It's about all the microbes in the soil and all of the insects and animals that it supports. So that, that's pretty interesting. You know, it's ecology, prairie restoration. There's things that people with many backgrounds talk about and are interested in that connects us. But of course, being indigenous people, Choctaw have a special connection. Some of this is in a name. You know, the name Yarrow may not mean a whole lot to us, but what about the Choctaw name for some of these plants? 
Ibakoa and Kish. Choctaw medicine, it's, it's a sacred thing. It's proprietary knowledge. You know, it's not something that we share, but sometimes the names for these plants tell you about medicinal uses. You know, yarrow, that's no bleed medicine in Choctaw. Showy wild garlic, that's onion medicine in the Choctaw language. Some of these names talk about some of these names for plants, you know, they, they record pretty amazing parts of Choctaw cultural knowledge. So, for example, sunflower is hashoshi in the Choctaw language, that's baby sun. In the traditional Choctaw way of thinking, you know, the sun was God's eye watching the earth, and as long as it watched you, you would prosper. For this reason, Choctaw diplomats preferred to have negotiations in full sunlight. Well, this plant is special and it's named sunflower basically in English and Choctaw because when it's young, the flower will track the sun during the day. So you can imagine the cultural significance that that has. This, this plant, its flowers look like the sun and they track God's eye during the day. You can imagine the significance that it has culturally from a Choctaw perspective. This plant was also one of the first domesticates in Eastern North America and the seeds are edible. Shomo is the Choctaw word for thistle. Um, thistles have a bad reputation, but there are 47 native species. Choctaw word for blogan dart, shomati. That comes from shomo, holo, shomo holoti, and that means wrapped with thistle. These blogan darts have fletchings that are wrapped around the ends of them to seal the breech so that the dart can go through the gun when you puff it. Those fletchings are made out of these feathers, when, made out of these flower petals when they dry. Without those thistles, you couldn't have Choctaw thistle blogan darts. Nochi milkweed, uh, when we changed the management, we had two different species of milkweed start to come back in our pastures. This is clasping milkweed. It looks like some type of alien invasion thing, but of course it's native. Our ancestors processed the bass fiber from those stalks to make string and yarn and cloth. Yucca, uh, I could talk about this for a long time. It's such a fascinating plant. Yucca exists only because there's one specific species of moth that pollinates it at nighttime. And that specific species of moth has been pollinating yucca for 40 million years. It's just because of that moth that the yucca exists, and it's just because of yucca that the moth exists. We don't think about yucca necessarily being part of the Choctaw homeland, but it is, along with a similar plant called bear grass. Uh, the leaves have fibers that are processed out for string. The stalk that you see there, uh, when it dries, it makes an excellent fire by friction starter. Hashonk Basi, Broom Sedge Blue Stem. This is one of the first prairie grasses that comes back when land management changes. What you see here is a full grown bison in a pasture of that on our land. And obviously this grass has a lot of biomass. Um, the, the Choctaw name for it records that it was used for making brooms, but grass like this obviously would have been useful for thatching structures and lots of other things that required grass, big dense grass. Lamb's quarter grows in prairie areas. It also grows in fertile stream banks. Um, this is an amazing food plant. The leaves from lamb's quarter have a better nutritional profile than raw spinach does. In the fall, the plant makes these huge crops of seeds. Um, they've got Seems like Ian has dropped out and hopefully he will be back soon. Um, while you guys, while we wait and see if his video works again, um, you guys, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those in the chat or the question and answer.
I was muted. You were right. I was muted. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let everyone know um, that um, all of the Chata Tisholi are recorded um, and they're put on the Choctaw Nation YouTube page. So you could just um, pull up um, the videos and you should be able to find this and all of the past um, recordings there. Okay, I think Ian logged off and he's going to try and log back on. We'll see what happens. Uh, the farm is Ian's personal property, yes. Um, and there's also a Choctaw Nation culture. That's the cultural services website. And so there's a Choctaw to Sholi page there. And you can find the links to all the recordings there as well. Mm. So many questions. All right. I'll be back, you guys, and call me and see what happens. All right, thank you everyone for your patience. Um, Ian will be back soon. His phone died and that's how he was using internet. <laughs> so that's why he got kicked off. Um, but he's um, charging his phone now and he will be back soon to finish the presentation. There he is. Thanks everyone for all your patience. We should be back up shortly. All right, I'm gonna read through people's questions now. Hey Megan, so I'm back, but it's not letting me share my screen for some reason. Do you need to set oh, me okay. up? Oh, okay. I do, I do. Let me just do that really quick. Um... Does that work? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So I'm going to go through some of these kind of quick, I guess, because um, obviously we just lost a little bit of time. 
sometimes Choctaw plant names record some really cool knowledge that we just don't quite grasp anymore. So for example, mountain mint, uh, it's a plant that came up in our lowlands when we changed the management. In Choctaw, it's called Chinook Tithili. This means drives out sand. You know, how, how a plant came to have the name drives out sand, I don't know, but that speaks to something interesting in terms of cultural knowledge. Um, sometimes they're a little bit ambiguous. The Choctaw name for wild rose is Kati Ancho. Hapcho means like crazy reckless. Does that mean that this has crazy reckless thorns? Probably, but it's a little bit interesting to think about. The old ethnobotanical sources talk about how Choctaws would use fish poison in the streams and it was made from a plant called devil shoestring. When we changed the management of our land, we had this plant come up on our land. It's called devil shoestring. Unfortunately, there are four or five different species called that in English, and it's difficult to know exactly which one Choctaws used. The one Choctaws used was called Imalosoc, but we don't know how that relates to an English species. I've showed this to some elders in Mississippi, and they think it may be the same plant, so that's kind of interesting. Some of the recorded Choctaw names, you know, it sounds sort of like the, the person was just kind of making up a name on the spot for the ethnologist. Sandbur, we're all familiar with that. Hasho Kalopa, pointed grass, that, that seems pretty self-evident. Some Choctaw names, um, you know, they're, they're recent names and they, they clearly copy the English names. Napakanli Lakna Nishkin Losa, that's the black-eyed yellow flower. The one that really copies English is the name for yellow sneezeweed, Noxatili Napakanli Lakna, choking yellow flower. Um, this flower doesn't even cause allergies. For some reason, it's captured that way in English, and so the, this Choctaw name follows English. So I, I've been showing you grasses and forbs. There are also a variety of woody plants that live in the prairie. One of the most obvious is there on the right. That's bowdark. It's called Kati Lakna in Choctaw, yellowthorn. It's one of the best bowwoods on the planet. That tree grows naturally in southeastern Oklahoma and north Texas, just in a small area. The Caddos who used to live here will trade that to the southeast, possibly including to the Choctaws. On the right is blackberries, bissa. Um, these are an important food, important enough that a month in the Choctaw calendar was named after them. But there are other, you know, more subtle, interesting plants that have important cultural knowledge. One of these is American beautyberry. The Choctaw name for that is wak ni patafpo. That means the cow's bed. I always thought that was a weird name until I learned that that plant has um, chemicals in it that keep biting insects away. There are actually some people that will rub that on themselves to keep them away. So that name in Choctaw refers to the animals laying on the plant to keep insects at bay. Pretty cool. River birch um, grows in wet areas along the prairies. Its Choctaw name is Opa Hoxel. And this appears to come from Opa Ola Ik Hoxel, which means doesn't hear the screech owl's call. Given that owls are messengers of death in Choctaw traditional thought, it's really interesting to think about what that name might mean. It's also really interesting because the same name is applied to the fossil clamshells that are found in the prairies of the Choctaw homeland. And these clamshells have two valves. The bottom one is thin. If you take that and burn it in a fire, it makes this flaky material that you see on the right there. Um, our ancestors who lived in those areas used that to mix with clay to make pottery. Well, that, that shell looks just like the bark of the tree almost. So pretty interesting. And then you think about the meaning of that name, it's just fascinating. Um, this is Chompalichi, an elder taught me about it. Sheep showers, it means make sweet in Choctaw. It's a traditional herb. Sand plums, of course. Um, I'm gonna skip over what I had about that just because we're a little short on time. One of my favorite trees in the prairie is prickly ash. The Choctaw name for it is Noti Elikchi. It means tooth doctor. If you take the inner bark from that, it has this chemical that just instantly neutralizes the nerves in your mouth. If you chew on that, your mouth goes numb instantly. That's one of the favorite plants of people who come on plant walks with us out there to, to chew on that tree a little bit. So what we've covered so far is just the plants in and of themselves, but of course they're part of a whole ecosystem and part of a whole culture. Um, this is a, a red oak tree, red oak also, lives along the prairies and the savannas. Um, this one came from our land. We're burning it out to make a mortar and pestle to prepare traditional food. This is Wallachshi. It's made from heirloom corn that was processed into flour and the mortar and pestle 
And then the, the sauce is made from blackberries that come from there on the land. This is sassafras tea. Um, it's also made from a tree that comes up along the prairie. It also makes an excellent dye. It was used as a summer tonic to help pe keep people cool. Traditional bread that's made from acorns there on the land. Traditional uh, acorn stew. Um, this Even the pot here has plant knowledge. It's made from clay that's mixed with um, Shomol Takali, it's made with Spanish moss that burns out and makes the pot so that it insulates when you cook in it with the stone boiling technique, which is what you see here. Even the animals relate back to the traditional knowledge of plants. So this is a, a roast from a deer that was harvested there on the land. It's a deer that's eaten all of these plants that have come up from the new management, and it's being cooked on a spit of sassafras wood that's also there from the land to impart flavor. But it's not just about meat, of course, respect means using every part of the animal as well as the plant. So this is burning the bones. Um, when they're burned, you can crush them up real fine. And our ancestors, especially around the time period of the Trail of Tears, would use that to mix with clay to keep it from cracking when they made pottery. This is a bowl that's being shaped using a, a deer bone, and then it's made of clay that has the deer bone ground up inside it. This is that pot being fired in a wood fire there on the farm. These are two finished Trail of Tears vessels made from that deer bone temper that came from the farm. These are about 70% clay and about 30% deer bone, even though you can't tell it by looking at them. The tendons, hawkshish, uh, were used for making bowstrings. Um, this is the process of doing that from the deer tendons. These are bowstrings. The bottom one's made from deer tendon. That's what it looks like when it's done. The next one's made from the escona, from the intestine, from the animal. The next one's made from red squirrel skin. The next one's made from the yucca plant that we were talking about earlier. Again, diversity. And then of course the hides, these are hides that are tanned traditionally and then they're smoked using plant materials that come from out there on our land. The smoke protects them from damage and it also gives them color. Harvesting the bison in particular is a harvest of the prairie. Um, you know, our herd naturally expands and we're keeping them within the, the right carrying capacity for the land. So that means we either sell breeding animals or we occasionally butch for bulls. Each bull represents about 400 pounds of meat. That's Amy there skinning one of the bowls that we slaughtered a couple months ago. Um, that hide will be brain tanned into a robe. Part of that process involves scraping the hide to thin it. We take the hide scrapings and render them into hide glue, which is what you see at the right there, this traditional hide glue made from buffalo hide scrapings from that hide that you're looking at. The bottom, those that's um, a spoon that's carved to look like a bison from the horn of that same bison. Of course, we use the tendons and various other things. This is sort of something modern that perpetuates the same concept. Um, when we purchased the land, it had trash dumps on it. Some of this included glass. This is a, a glass arrow point that's chipped from one of those trash pieces of glass using a tool that was made from a buffalo leg bone. So it's kind of coming full circle. With Choctaw culture, you know, these are, these are just some things that we've done. It's been an awesome learning experience and it, it will continue as long as we live probably, but we're still only scratching the surface. Choctaw culture comes from 15,000 years of interaction with our homeland. It represents a unique part of the human experience. It's never gonna be repeated again. And it includes knowledge that Western science doesn't necessarily possess. Choctaw people gave up aspects of our traditional knowledge, not because it didn't work, but because of colonization and because of the, so many of our people died from disease. So oftentimes revitalizing this knowledge has the opportunity to improve quality of life for people living today. You know, that's most obvious through Choctaw traditional foods. You know, our foods are an antidote to obesity, diabetes, stroke, high blood pressure, many of the things that affect our families every day. Going beyond that, the relationship with the land is something that is one of the biggest issues for humanity in general with climate change. You know, the, the treatment of the landscape has re released a, something like a trillion tons of soil carbon into the air, let alone the burning of fossil fuels. When you look back to indigenous cultures such as Choctaw, they provide means for living with the land that are sustainable. You know, I think looking to the future, we have so many opportunities in our own traditional culture just bringing these things back to life and plants are a key part of that. We've shared some of this information through the Indigenous Choctaw Food Book. Um, it's something that I authored that includes some of this knowledge and donated to Choctaw Nation, who now distributes it. We also try to create conversations through um, a blog that we have about landscape 
restoration, about traditional culture, all kinds of things like that. Because you know, it's about community. It's not just about what we're doing. We're just ha happy to share a little bit of our experiences. So I apologize for um, cutting out there, but we still got maybe two or three minutes for questions. I'll be glad to, to answer if somebody would like to offer some. We actually still have, could have up to 30 minutes because um, it, it's an hour and a half, but I don't know if you have a limited time, Ian. Uh, I've got half an hour if people would like to talk, sure. All right, there were lots of questions. So I will get started with them. Um, so I know you mentioned one, but are there other plants that ancestral Choctaws use to keep pests away? I believe there are. So the main way that they kept pests away that I know of is that they would build these smoke pits in their villages. Uh, you dig out a, a little depression in the ground, you fill it full of really hot hardwood coals, and then you put rotten wood in it, or you put pine cones in it and those smolder. So it creates this, this kind of smoky environment that keeps the insects away. That was the main way that they did it in their villages. Um, from time to time, they would get bugs in their house and they would do the same thing in their house. They would just seal everything up, leave the house and smoke it just as much as they could. Even like with wasps building in the thatch, the Choctaw houses, that happens sometimes. You know, when you build that kind of smoky fire, that'll help get rid of them. There are other plants that um, by rubbing them on yourself, are supposed to keep insects away. I know you see it in the movies, like the native guys getting chased by hound dogs or something like that. So he grabs this plant and rubs it on them and then the dogs can't follow him. I'm not aware of any plant like that, but um, you know, things like horse mint, that plant I showed you earlier, that's supposed to have some properties of keeping insects off. They also sometimes would rub like charcoal on themselves or sometimes um, different minerals to keep insects off too. And bear oil too, supposedly helps keep insects off. Cool. Um, someone said, excellent talking and very inspiring. Does the Choctaw Nation plan to apply your methods to tribal lands in Oklahoma or in the traditional homeland? What, what we're doing is just kind of like our family. I mean, it's, it's not necessarily tied to Choctaw Nation, although we're happy to share the information. So, um, you know, like Choctaw land management, they already do incorporate some of these concepts, like especially the, the wildfire suppression um, through creating burns. You know, our forestry department burns thousands of acres every year, and this helps to restore an open patchy environment. Um, similar techniques are used by Mississippi National Forests in Mississippi. Um, they've been restoring tens of thousands of acres of longleaf pine forest. Um, the, the Natural Resource Conservation Service in Mississippi is restoring prairie. Like most of those pictures that I showed you of our healthy homeland, that, that came from those restorations that they're doing. But there's lots and lots of opportunity. Choctaw Nation is working with a consortium of other tribes and federal entities in the Southeast to try to encourage major river king restoration projects right now. But the, the opportunities are almost endless. Nice. Um... Someone was wondering if identifying available land is a problem or if it's a, a problem of identifying specific land. Um, could any ranch lands in Choctaw Nation or southeastern Oklahoma be converted and re rehabilitated or does it require something special with what you're doing? Pretty much any lands could be converted. You know, if you're if you're going to set up a farm and live out there, you know, you obviously want to think about things like water sources, um, accessibility, neighbors, what what's going to happen in this area 40 years from now. But really, these concepts can be applied to any piece of land. And, you know, we, we put a Choctaw spin on them for sure, but people all over the country are doing similar things in, in different areas. They're using similar concepts to restore the health of the land and the plant communities. Um, someone was wondering, how many head of bison do you have? Well, so when we, when we first set up our farm, our plan was to have 30 to 40 bison, because that's what the, the ranch managers who do bison for a living told us we could have out there. But as we got into it, we found that if we wanted to have that many, it would mean basically destroying the native environment and planting it in fertilized grasses. So we're not doing that. So we, we've matched it to an actual native kind of carrying capacity, which is 
we've got nine bison out there and two Choctaw ponies. And that seems to be about right for the land right now. As the grasses restore, we might be able to add a couple of more, but it's not going to be huge amounts because if we did, it would damage the land. Um, someone else was wondering, um, what is your background on land management? Um, do you have an agro science or agro business background, or did you learn as you went? Um, what kind of supports do you need around you to successfully do what you've kind of done? So I, I grew up spending every bit of time that I could out on the land and, and of course, participating in parts of indigenous Choctaw culture that are land based. But I, I don't have a background in agriculture. Um, there are things that I, I've learned as I've gone along, some of it from a cultural perspective, some of it from a, a holistic management type perspective. Um, you know, getting involved in the National Bison Association, taking holistic pasture management classes, taking fire classes, things like that. There are lots and lots of opportunities out there to learn these types of things if you're interested, but be aware there is some bad information and be aware that it's harder than it looks. Um, you might like we do <clears throat> like we did. You might think that you can move out there and, you know, we're going to restore this land in a couple of years and it's going to be beautiful. It, it doesn't happen that way. It, it's a lot, lot harder than you might think. Well, do you have any tips, I guess, <laughs> for those people who might be interested? Yeah, get involved with support groups, people who are interested in similar things. Um, there's the Oklahoma Native Plant Society. You know, they are fantastic in helping you to learn about the different plants and ecosystems. There are places like the um, Nature Conservancy that are always willing to share information. There's a blog by Chris Halzer called The Prairie Ecologist. And that each week that shares new information about the interactions between the plants and the different animals on the prairie. There's the Noble Foundation in Oklahoma. Um, if you're interested in sustainable landscape management, they can definitely help you with that. They've certainly helped us. Um, there are different entities like, for example, holistic pasture management. Um, a lot of those classes are offered. That's similar to the technique that we set up with all the different pastures. They'll teach you how to do that. I, I would just recommend if you follow that route, also make sure that it's backed up by learning about ecology too, because some of the some of the ideas that are put forward there aren't, aren't fully sound, but a lot of them are. Um, there's an Indigenous Peoples Burning Network. It's a good place to get involved. Um, there are local fire cooperatives in Oklahoma. Unfortunately, not southeastern Oklahoma. The closest one is Johnston County, but those are great places to get experience. Um, a lot of times, like National Grasslands, and as I mentioned before, Nature Conservancy, they have opportunities to volunteer. The, the opportunities are just almost endless. And what's the website to your blog so people can check it out as well? It's nonawaya.com, www.nanawaya.com. Perfect. Um, and someone asked, um, in your time living at Nanawaya, have you noticed any particular birds coming back or reappearing on the land? Yes, we have. Um, it was amazing. Like almost as soon as we built our house out there, there was a bald eagle that just came and circled and circled and circled over our house. That that was incredible. And then last spring, um, we started noticing out there there are these just amazingly colorful birds. They're called painted buntings, and they're blue and green and red and orange all at the same time. They come through in the spring. It's so neat to watch them. But to be honest, I, I have lots more to learn about birds. A few years ago, I couldn't identify most of the plants growing in our pastures. And I was thinking, well, how, how indigenous am I if I can't identify all these plants on my own farm? So, you know, really set to learning how to do that. And now birds are something I need to learn more about too. It's pretty impressive. That is a lot of plants that you kind of had up there. So, um, Someone asked about your book because they noticed that it wasn't on the Choctaw Nation website. So could you let people know what's going on with your book? Sure, the, the book sold out at the Choctaw store. Um, it is available through the Choctaw Nation Capital Museum. And I'm also working on a, a second edition right now to put, put new information in there, basically a couple more years of learning that hopefully will be done here in a few months and available at Choctaw store again. 
Um, and there were a few questions asking about um, what kind of plants could be used for particular ailments. And I was, um, did you want to talk about any of those or? They're asking about traditional plants for like headaches or things like that. Yeah, I can talk about it to you. You know, a lot of those are the not are the property of Choctaw medicine people. You know, a lot of those specific cures. Um, I, I'll talk about one just to show the the power that exists there. Uh, I know an individual whose uncle was diabetic and he was in a car wreck, and he got gangrene in his foot. And he was at the the hospital, and they told him, you know, we're going to have to amputate this leg because it, it's infected. And he said, no, that's not going to happen. I want to go home. So they took him home, and he told his family that he wanted to go see this medicine person, this Choctaw medicine person. So they drove way out in the woods. This was in Mississippi. And they drove way out in the woods, and they came to this house, and the medicine person was sitting there on the porch waiting. You know, and he didn't have a phone, but he was sitting out on the porch waiting for them anyway. And when they came up, he said, okay, I, I've got this medicine that'll help you. And it was this medicine he was supposed to drink and bathe in every day. And this gentleman did it. And within a very short time, it had healed his gangrene and his diabetes, both. Western medicine can't do that. So that, that's the power that exists in some Choctaw traditional medicine. Uh, as I said, cures like that are the, the property of the specific medicine people. But there are all kinds of different things that are useful. You know, for example, um, my mom uses tobacco all the time. Like if you get stung by something, um, if you get some type of like a throat infection, she'll take the tobacco and mix it with water and put it on a rag and hold it on there and it, it draws the poison out. But for example, you know, in the winter time, um, there can be issues with colds and things like that. If you go out and you find the wild rose that I was showing you there earlier, it's got these little red um, balls on the end of the stalks. You can eat those and they're incredibly high in vitamin C. They'll help keep you from getting a cold. Um, okay. I think that was all of the questions that I kind of saw. If anyone wants to throw in a couple of ones, this is your time, this is your chance. <laughs> oh, someone asked what parts of thistle can you use? Sandra. All right, so the thistle, when it comes up and it's young, it's edible, kind of like, you know, if you guys have eaten uh, the shoots of a poke plant when they're young, you know, you can take them and boil them. You can do the same thing with the thistle. Um, with the thistle, you know, also it's the, the blowgun fletching that I was talking about. You can tell, mostly you can tell native thistles from non-native thist thistles. Uh, the native thistles, if you look at the leaf, it'll be dark colored on top and it'll be white underneath. The, the invasive ones are usually the same color on both sides. Um, do you know anything about edible mushrooms that, or medicinal mushrooms? have harvested over the years? That's one of the things where, you know, when you're looking at Choctaw traditional knowledge that's been recorded in Western sources, a lot of times it suffers because the Western folks didn't know the species of plants or mushrooms that they were dealing with. So, you know, in, in the really old sources, there are Choctaw names for, I think, four different species of mushrooms. But unfortunately, we don't even know for sure which species those referred to. So there, there are surviving recipes from way back in the day, Choctaw recipes, um, you know, making dishes out of corn and mushrooms, but we don't know for sure which ones those are. You know, most likely they're the mushrooms from the homeland, things like morels or chanterelles that are edible today, but, but we don't know specifically, at least I know. Everyone was very in the comments, if you can't see them. We're very impressed with all the knowledge that you kind of have and to be able to learn from your experiences, which are pretty intense. And it's a, such a wide range of skills that you and Amy um, evidently very clearly have. Um, and so they, every, there are lots of thank yous for you in the comments. Well, thank um, you. It's it's an honor to get to share these things, and you know we all come from Choctaw people, or even if you're not Choctaw, you still come from Indigenous people. So we all have a shared heritage on the land. 
Yeah. Um, awesome. So I guess that will be kind of the end of our event for today. Um, and so our next Tata Tisholi is going to be on Thursday, May 6th at 1 p.m. Our speakers will be Dr. Irvin Garrison and Jim Wilson, who are two faculty members from the University of Georgia, who are working to create connections between removed tribes and their homelands. So we'll be hearing a little bit more about their Homeland Returns project um, then. So I look forward to seeing you all there again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.